الدين الظاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنحيتهم سبلنا صلى الله عليك يا باب الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله روحي وجسمي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء يا غريب يا مظلوم يا شهيد في أرض كربلاء صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله I was talking last night about the word Islam itself and Iman being very vibrant concept that you do not have faith in Arabic, you do faith. And that Islam itself, as used in the Quran, is not a religion, is not a noun, not an institution, but it's actually an act of doing, of giving, of submission. And therefore, it's something that you engage with. I want to continue along the theme, but in a different tangent tonight, which is the question that is posed by many Muslims and non-Muslims, how can a religion which was brought in the 7th century by our Prophet survive in this day? How are we able to implement those laws which were revealed and sometimes interpreted 7th, 8th century? How can they change in our own society? Because after all, we are living in North Se uh, in 21st century America. We are not living in 8th century Arabia. How can those laws be applied here today? Is there a need to reinterpret it? To revisit the laws? To put it differently, do we need to modernize Islam or Islamize modernity? Do we need to modernize Islam or Islamize modernity? Of course, Muslims will say that we do not need to modernize Islam, but we need to Islamize modernity, that is for sure. In order to start this debate and this discussion, there is one point, a very fundamental point, which even Muslims have failed to consider, which is the difference between Sharia and Fiqh. There is a one, the problem in English is English language is very poor. They keep saying Islamic law. When we use the term Islamic law, what are we referring to? Is it Sharia or is it Fiqh? What is the difference between Sharia and Fiqh? Sharia are those values, those principles, those laws which are revealed in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet. The values, the principles which we abide by. That is the Sharia. The Fiqh is the human understanding and application of that Sharia. Do you understand the distinction? The Sharia is divine. The fiqh is human. That is why there is one Sharia for all Muslims. When you consider and think about it, all Muslims believe in the same God. They believe in the same Quran. They believe in the same Prophet. All Muslims believe that killing is wrong, at least apart from ISIS. All Muslims believe that lying is wrong, and so on. So all Muslims have the same Sharia. But Muslims do not have the same fiqh. Within the Ahlul Sunnah, how many schools are there? Four today. At one time, there were even more than that. In other words, fiqh is the human interpretation of the divine Sharia. There is even within the uh, Shia also, there are differences of interpretation. And therefore, when the, when the West actually says, you hear so many times, we don't want Sharia, we don't want Sharia law, they don't even know what they're talking about. It's not the Sharia they're talking about, they're talking about fiqh. And fiqh is human interpretation of the divine law. So what we are talking about now is not the Sharia, it is actually fiqh. And therefore, we say that we follow the fiqh of Imam Jafar Sadiq. We never say we follow the Sharia of Imam Jafar Sadiq. Did you notice that? We say we are following the fiqh. Abu Hanifa had his own fiqh, Shafi had his own fiqh, and so on. In other words, what we are trying to say is that where a Sharia cannot change because it is divine, it is a matter of principle, fiqh can and must change according to time. 
And I will prove to you how the faith has evolved with time. And how we need to reconsider and revisit faith. And let us not forget that the faith that we are talking about was interpreted, formulated by scholars in the 7th, 8th century. And even when they reinterpreted in the medieval centuries, they were talking about Muslims when they were in the Akhtariyah, Akhtariyah Middle East. Yani, una aksara shun Musliman Buddha, dar kun zaman. Un jayya Buddha ke aksara un dar un kashbar, Musliman Buddha. They were living and talking about a place where most of the people were Muslims. But in today's world, I don't know whether you realize it, never in the history of Islam have so many Muslims lived in areas where they are in the minority. Never. Muslims, they lived in minority areas. They were in Spain, they were in Russia, they were in Bosnia, they were in China. But never in their history was, have so many Muslims lived in areas where they are in the minority. Over 300 million, by the way. What does it tell us? That now we are talking of laws which were implemented, created, interpreted in the 8th, 9th, sometimes 11th centuries where Muslims were in the majority. But when Muslims are in the minority, their challenges are different. Their questions are different. So how do we implement those laws in today's world? Sallu ala Muhammad wa For example, how do we talk of banking laws here in the West? How do we pray in the Arctic? I don't know whether you know about this, but in Canada, I'm Canadian, uh, and there is a place called Ninuit, you can Google it. And even Ninuit, which is in the Arctic Circle, there is a mosque there. In the mosque is called the Mosque of the Midnight Sun. The Mosque of the Midnight Sun. It is so cold there, they could not build the mosque, they had to build it in Winnipeg, and then take it about 4,000 uh, kilometers right to up there. They, were, they used to worship, there are about over 100 Muslims there. What I'm trying to say is that there, how do you pray? How do you fast? Well, you cannot see the sunrise or sunset, depending whether you are in winter or in summer. These are some of the challenges that our scholars are confronted with today. Well, essentially what we are talking about here is what we call Ijtihad. Now, the moment you talk of Ijtihad, people talk, talk think of Jihad. Huh? Everything is jihad. In ishtihad, ishtihad, jihad means in jihad akliyas. This is what we call mental jihad. Mental jihad is ishtihad. In other words, how do you exert reasoning? How do you exert reasoning in order to derive and create new laws in the contemporary times? You must understand one thing, my sisters and brothers. Times change. Laws change, societies change. If the fit doesn't change with time, then that fit will be outdated. It will be outmoded. And that's why there are books, conferences written, which says, Ishtihad wa zaman of the makan. Ishtihad wa zaman of makan. Ishtihad and time and place. When I talk to Western audiences, non Muslims, and I ask them which country in the world the Muslim world has got the most of this reasoning, ishtihad. Does anybody know which country in the world has got the most uh, ishtihad today? It is in Iran. Iran, the Islamic Republic, has got the most ishtihad in Qum itself. In other words, now the ulama are coming up rethinking, sometimes even challenging, revising earlier laws, depending on time. There is a very important hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Which is that the Imam says, we give you the laws, we give you the principles. We give you the principles, you derive the laws based on your needs and on your times. We give you very general principles. Ishtihad, the reason for this ishtihad is this. Because the Imam gave us certain traditions also. But you cannot apply those traditions at all times. Because those traditions are talking for a particular context, for a particular time. What if the context changes? That's why we talk of ishtihad. Ishtihad enables us not only to think, but also to rethink. 
it enables us not only to formulate a law, but to reformulate a law. There is another very important principle, which is coming from the Quran, by the way. And I want us to pay attention to this. The Quran says, Wallahu yuridu lakumul yusr, wa la yuridu lakumul usr. Allah wishes ease for you. He does not wish difficulties for you. He doesn't want you to create a law or a dunya which is difficult for you. Contrary to what we may think, Allah doesn't want to make our lives miserable for us. Sometimes a law worked and was useful in the olden times, but that same law becomes very difficult for people in a different context. And that's another reason why the laws change. My sisters and brothers, basically we are talking of reformation. But reformation or reform, revisiting, is only possible when Muslims are able to speak their minds and discuss things openly. I feel very comfortable here talking to you because I know that you will at least listen to me. You may disagree with me, that's fine, but hopefully you will not abuse. In some quarters, the moment you mention these things, astaghfirullah, haram, bid'ah, and so on. On the contrary, we, and I think in many cases, we have an emotional rather than a rational Islam. We need an Islam which is rational, not just emotions. As I always say, Islam came to liberate our minds, not to close it, huh? But we unfortunately, we have closed our mind. Islam came to liberate our minds, not to close it. Somebody said very correctly that your mind is like a parachute. Have you seen a parachute? Your mind is like a parachute. It only works when you open it. You know what happens if you don't open a parachute? It's a one-way, non-refundable trip to Kabastan. Huh? You go, you don't come back. So therefore, it's important that we open our minds and not close it. We must understand also the laws of Islam in Ahkama Sujana Mada. Mamidul Kiram Ahkama Salazyada Rikar Islam. In Ahkam Asujama Mada. Where did they come from? Sabaikan Dar Zamana Sabek in the old days. Before Islam, understand this much. Before the coming of Islam, there were laws with them. Islam did not bring everything new. There were customary laws. There were laws of the Arabs. What the Quran did was to put certain, what we call charjube, or framework. In other words, it put certain ethical principles in mind. That you cannot violate these principles. As long as those pre-Islamic laws did not go against the Quranic principles, Islam actually adopted many pre-Islamic laws. Do we know that? There are three types of laws. Sejuri Ahkamastan. Our Ahkame Ta'sisi. Our call Ta'sisi. Ta'sisi are those laws which Islam initiated, created, primarily in Ibadat. Islam created laws of how to pray, how to fast, Hajj, and so on. These are called Ta'sisi. Others are called Imzai. Uh, no, let's call Islahi, first of all. So there is Ta'sisi. Islahi are those which Islam reformed, changed a little bit. So, for example, when Islam came, there were already laws regarding Isdivaj, regarding marriage. The Arabs had laws regarding marriage. For example, one of the laws said that the Mahar, we talk about Mahar a lot these days, the Mahar, according to the Arabs, is supposed to be given to the father of the bride. Islam changed that. It retained the concept of Mahar, but said the Mahar should not be given to the father, it should be given to the bride herself and so many other uh, examples. But there's a third principle, or akam. These are called imzahi. Imza midun yanichikal, imza imza kardam. To signature, to put your signature in, to endorse it. So many of our laws actually came from pre-Islamic Arabia. A lot of our akam, especially when it comes to society, social transaction, in her injury, in her These are endorsed laws. So, for example, laws on contracts, many laws on mutra itself. It's not something that Islam created. It was there from before. Laws, for example, on the year, on blood money, and so on. Anybody who has studied the history of Islamic law will tell you that. What does that mean? You know, it means pre-Islamic does not mean un-Islamic.
Just because a law was pre-Islamic doesn't mean that it's un-Islamic. If it was against the ethical, moral framework of the Quran, yes, Islam rejected it. For example, in uh, female infanticide, as you know, before the coming of Islam, baby girls were killed, they were buried alive. Islam said, this is inhumane, you cannot do this. We must stop it right away. And the Quran forbade it right away. So what we find there, therefore, that a lot of our laws, which were adopted or endorsed by Islam, came from pre-Islamic Arabia. Other laws, for example, child custody, the question of who is the guardian of the, of the young girl, and so on. And this is where Ishtihad comes in. Because what the Alim does is to use and reinterpret those laws according to the needs of the time. Sallu ala Muhammad wa And that's why I say that a mujtahid or an alim is a bridge between the books and the people. He is the conscious of the community. He doesn't just sit in one corner. He feels the pain and the suffering of the people. One of the requirements of a mujtahid, therefore, is that he must know the local custom of the time. Because when you know the local custom, you know the needs of the time also. Uh, Marhum uh, Allama Murtaza Muttahari used to say that fatwa ya dihati, buya dihati minar. That the fatwa of a village gives the smell of a village. Because it was created in a village, the fatwa was given a village, so it gives the smell of a village. But if that fatwa was given in Tehran rather than in uh, Iraq, for example, it would be different. Because according to the needs and the time of that earth. We must also remember one thing, that the law is there to fulfill the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, these fatwas that we give are supposed to create the law question of ease and justice. When a fatwa is unjust, to me, this is my understanding, we believe that Allah is just, don't we? A God who is just can never have a fatwa or a law which is unjust. Do you agree? Because the two have to sync with each other. The lawgiver is just, the laws must be just too. He cannot discriminate or issue a law against somebody simply because you are a woman, therefore you have to do this because you are a woman. Without there being a rationale behind it. And I'm going to give you examples which will show you why things have to have changed and need to change. This is a bit heavy stuff. It may be controversial. But I believe that we as Muslims, as the followers of Nul Bayn, should not just accept things blindly. I'm challenging you to think today. In the olden days, now this is amongst the Ahlul Sunnah, the Shias have their own uh, law on this too. Supposing you have a husband who is AWOL, you know what's AWOL? Absent without leave. He has just disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. Is he dead? Is he just mutating around? And in those days, you did not even Google to that you can Google the jerk. You don't know what has happened to him. The question that was asked, and this is a serious question by the way, how long does a woman have to wait for? Check out in Tazar Hukurin Khanu. Can he she get another husband? How long can she wait until she can get another husband? Because she, she doesn't know where the husband is going. We don't know whether he's dead or he just run away or what. According to Hanafi Fiqh, and I'm not putting down anybody here, I'm stating a law, and you can, you're welcome to recheck it. According to Hanafi Fiqh, she does not have to wait very long. Ishul in Hanum Bayat Sadobisal Mutazir Bashar. She has to wait 120 years. If he doesn't turn up after 120 years, and I don't know about you, but I have not even seen a woman of 120 years. Let alone one waiting, looking for a hubby, you know, at 120 years with her dentures falling out. According to Shafi, if no, no, she doesn't have to wait 120 years, she only waits 90 years. Now, the reason why they kept this 120 years and 90 years is because that was the average lifespan of a person in those days. They did not have McDonald's or KFC in those days. So you would live longer, apparently. According to the Maliki law, which is also close to our own law, she goes and talks to a Hakim Ashar, a Mushtahi, who will then conduct a search for him. And if he doesn't turn up within three or four years, 
then she is free to remarry, which makes far more sense than having to wait 120 years. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Another example of how the laws are connected with the society. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. They cannot hear me properly, apparently. So maybe we need to do, do something. I'm glad you pointed it out because I cannot, I don't know whether you can hear me or not. Maybe somebody can adjust the mic so that they can hear me. A little bit. They say that it, it doesn't reach, the sound doesn't reach at the back. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala In the olden days, for example, during the time of the Imams, the mark, as I mentioned yesterday, was given immediately at the time or after the marriage. So that was the custom. Supposing a woman claims that she had not received the mahar, the law said in those days, because the custom was that the mahar was given at the time of the marriage, she has to produce evidence that she did not receive it. She has to produce evidence because the custom was she would get it at the time of the marriage. Now, if you go back, if you go forward in this 14th century, during the time of Shahidul Awal, the law changes because the custom changes. Can you hear me now? Better? Alhamdulillah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa The law changes now because the customs changed. The custom during the time of Shahidul Awal in the 14th century was that the mahar was given much later on. The mahar was given much later on after marriage. And therefore if the same woman was living later on and she claimed she does not grieve, she has not received her mahar, now it is the husband who has to produce the evidence that he had given mahar. Because the law has changed, the custom has changed. In other words, what I'm trying to say is laws are not fixed forever. Laws change according to time. And this is what we call dynamic ishtihad. There are Farsi, because fiqh puya, not fiqh sunnati. We don't know fiqh puya, the fiqh which is dynamic, which changes with time. For example, in the olden days, did you know this? It was haram to sell blood. Anything which had no value, you cannot sell it. You cannot sell something which has no value at all. But now we know that blood has a lot of value. It can save a life. So now you can charge for blood, although I wouldn't do it, but you can't charge for blood, technically speaking. Similarly, Sheikh Atosi, one of our great scholars who died in the 11th century, he used to have a fatwa that in winter it is haram to sell water because well, water was plentiful. There was no value for it. You could not sell it. But summer, you can sell water because water was in short supply. So these are just some examples of how laws change with time. We must remember that we sometimes use the past rulings in modern times and we accept them as infinite and eternal. Remember this much, sisters and brothers. If we were to say that just because there was a law in the past and it must continue forever and ever and ever, then you and me would have to accept slavery today. Are we prepared to accept slavery? Of course not. We treat it as totally repugnant and obnoxious. Now, the Quran accepted slavery, but it was trying to reduce and abolish slavery gradually. It could not just eliminate it overnight. And therefore, you remember, if you miss a fast deliberately in the month of Ramadan, what is the first kafara? You free a slave. Huh? So, in many other cases, you give a false oath, for example, a vow which is false. You say that, yes, I've seen it when you have not seen it. You have to give a kafara, and the first kafara is you have to free a slave. In other words, Islam was trying to do away with slavery. But we can't say that just because slavery was there at the time of the Prophet or in the Quran that we should have slavery today. We are reinterpreting the law according to the needs of the time. We have to remember there is another principle 
that we work under. The principle is this. Kullama hakama bihil aql, hakama bihil shara. Which means this, that whatever your reasoning tells you, the sharia will tell you the same. Now that doesn't mean that we just go and create our own laws and change laws according to the way that we like. It has to be done by those who are professionals and those who are experts in the field. What we are saying is this, Allah has given you aql, has given all of us aql. Why would he give us aql and tell us, no, don't use it? On the contrary, he says, I've given you something for you to use it, not to abuse it, not to misuse it. And therefore, every time you'll see in the Quran, Afala ya'kilum, Afala yadabarum, Afala yafqahum, don't they think, don't they ponder? Islam is asking, the Quran is asking us this. So whatever the aql tells you, the sharia will tell you just the same thing. Aql cannot tell you something and the sharia tells you the opposite. Yes, aql will tell you that killing is evil. The sharia cannot tell you that killing is okay. Unless there is certain circumstances, for example, punishment. Or you don't have to defend yourself. Even aql will tell you that, that you can defend yourself. Sallu ala Muhammad wa alayhi There is, to be sure, and this is part of my next book, by the way, I'm writing a book on ijtihad and reformation. I hope there won't be any fatwas passed against me after that. But it's okay, somebody has to do it. The, the point is that there is an intellectual revolution. Many of us do not hear about it. In the seminaries, in Qom, amongst the younger brand of ayatollahs of, or of scholars, who are revisiting, rethinking the law. For example, the law on whether a woman can be a judge or not is a very controversial law, by the way. There is nothing in the Quran that says, There is no hadith which tells us that a woman cannot be a kazi, a judge. But yet, because, let's not forget, the scholars were who? They were men, huh? And when men write something, they don't have women in their minds. They only have men in their minds. So in those days, women were not scholars. We're talking of the 7th, 8th century. They were not educated. They could barely read or write. They were baby machines. Let's be honest about it. But in today's world, there are women who are more clever and more educated than you and me. I was telling you only the other day that of our own girl within our own community, who helps uh, program that spacecraft which, which went up to Saturn. You remember that? Uh, if I assume that women are not a sul that uh, their intellect is somehow deficient, then I'm in big trouble because many a time I fly Air Canada and, and Air Canada at 35,000 feet, I realize the pilot is a woman. <laughs> the one who's pilot, if she, I don't trust her judgment, then I'm in big trouble. The point being that we cannot depend on previous estimation or understanding of the value of women. Women have far more value today and far more educated and more smart than men are. You go to Iran, by the way, I'm told 65%. Shastopan Darsal. Tulaba Danesha Kiyastan, Khanumastan. There are women in the, in the universities. In other words, just because something was stated in the past, it doesn't mean that it's the same today. Some circumstances have changed. Because of that, some ulama are arguing that women can also be judges too. Women can excel, they can, some are saying women can even be mushtahids and even marajah. Because marjaiyat does not depend on your gender. It depends on your knowledge. It depends on how well you are educated. Listen to this fatwa given by Ayatollah Mujnurdi, not Murujardi, Mujnurdi. In the past, I don't know about you, but I was brought up to believe that when our talk to Imam Sahib was Zaman alayhi salam, <laughs> that when the Imam appears, he will spread Islam and anybody who opposes him, he will kill him. Haven't you heard that? That's what I used to believe. He says no. Ayatollah Mujnardi says no. The Quran says very clearly, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion. Even the Prophet cannot go against the Quran. He cannot force people to become Islam. How can the Imam do that? 
He says, the Imam's jihad will not be by the sword or by the tank or by nuclear weapons. The Imam's jihad will be through dialogue. It will be through understanding, which makes more sense if we think about it. Because you cannot establish justice through murder. The Imam's function is to establish justice and equality. He cannot establish justice by being unjust to people. So because you don't believe in me, I'll kill you. On the contrary, he'll spread justice and equality and respect other people. Today also, we have a new genre of literature. New kind of books coming up. Mutasefani ma ziyad na mikhunim ha? Pagat bush mi dey, pagat fara bush mikhunim. We don't read much. We just hear and then we forget. There is a special kind of books which have been published from Qom, from Najaf. Also, in a Hamish to English, tarjuma shule, fiqh lil muqtaribin, ahkam lil muqtaribin, which means the laws for those who are living in the West. The ulama have realized that the, uh, those living in the West, their issues, their uh, particular issues or questions are different. So, for example, swearing allegiance to a non-Muslim government or being a judge in America, for example. Is a Muslim allowed to be a judge? Can you take interest from a bank? Can you work and can you sell stocks and bonds and invest? And so on. All these are issues which were never there because now we are living as <coughs> we are living as minorities. Questions of artificial insemination or what we call test tube babies. There's nothing in the Quran about test tube, I can assure you. Nor in the hadith. Or IVF, you know what's IVF? In vitro fertilization. Fertilizing outside the womb. And so on. These are issues which were never there. And our ulama, these are all given by the way. I don't have the time to go into details. But just to give you some of the challenges. And why the laws are coming up new and new. I want us to get rid of this idea that Islam is fixed and static and you cannot change. As I've said, that with time and change, the laws also change. Supposing you have a Muslim, and there are Muslims now who are training to be astronauts. Huh? You are a Muslim, you are an astronaut, you are orbiting the earth, but then you must pray also. How often do we pray? Five times every day. Five prayers. Okay. Now you are orbiting, where is Makkah from there? It's somewhere down there. Huh? Okay. Somewhere down there, but... Even to keep your feet on the ground up there is a major jihad, you know, because you are floating about. The question arises is this, the main problem, I don't know whether you are aware of this. Your day when you are orbiting the earth lasts how long, you know? 90 minutes. Every 90 minutes you see the sunrise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset. Every 90 minutes. In other words, over every 24 hours, for every 24 hours, you will see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. Now, if you are going to pray five prayers every 90 minutes, because your day is 90 minutes, by the time you finish, so many time for Zohar, you tell me finish Zohar, time for Asr, by the time you finish Asr, time for Maghrib, then not even bother going up there, my friend. Because all you do is just pray 